Hello, everyone. I am Anisha Archibald, Women's Ministries Coordinator of the Southwest Region Conference. Welcome to day two of our Seniors Empowerment Weekend. We thank you in advance for your cooperation in keeping your mics muted because we are live. We are focusing on the theme, aging gracefully, finishing well. Now, have you ever considered the millions of senior men and women that have set examples of resilience for us to follow? They have done so by overcoming hardships and by finding new ways to thrive. The Women's Ministries Department believes it is vital for us to use every opportunity to strengthen, encourage, and empower our seniors. We are guided today for that purpose. Our moderator for this evening is Sister Bonnie Shepherd, and it is our prayer that the presentations will bless your heart and soul. So we welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you tonight. Sister Shepherd, it is your time. Be blessed. Thank you, Sister Archibald. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And as your moderator this evening, I hope you get to hear very little from me because we want to hear the presenters. But we will follow uh, the outline as I am about to state here now, we will have our opening prayer by Sister Faye Pleasant. Then we will have music. We will have an introduction of a speaker uh, by Sister Patricia Reed. We will have a uh, presenter, Sister Norma Carter, then additional music, another introduction of the speaker, uh, Sister Doris Green Hunter. And then we will introduce some questions and answers. So if we could continue to stay muted unless you are to present, it would be very much appreciated. And with that, I will turn it over to Sister Faye Pleasant for our opening prayer. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, ladies of Southwest Region Conference and all conferences all over the world. What a blessed day it is. And on this Sabbath day, as we come together, and I ask that you would bow with me as we seek the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, what a wonderful God you are. You're high and lifted up, you're holy. Lord, you're able to do anything but fail. And we ask, dear Father, a special blessing from you that you would send down your blessings to our speakers this evening, our presenters, our moderator, anyone that's on the program, anyone that's just joined us, Lord. Reach out to the families of all the ladies that are on with us. And then bless your Father. Touch as only you can. If someone's sick, Father, I ask for healing. If someone is weak, Lord, I ask for strength. If someone is tired, give them a touch of your love, Lord. May your Holy Spirit go from heart to heart and breast to breast as we're here on the lines together, that we would all know and remember that God has been here with us. Thank you, dear Father. And Lord, when time shall be no more, may you come back and find us watching, waiting, and working. For it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Truth can be found. 
everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker this evening. Norma Carter, the daughter of missionary parents, was born in Jamaica. She spent her formative years not only in Jamaica, but in the Bahamas and Cayman Islands. After graduating from West Indies College, now Northern Caribbean University in Mandeville, Jamaica, she relocated to Toronto, Canada, where she met and later married and went to work for Carter. In 1980, they moved to Dallas, Texas, where they established themselves in the healthcare industry as owner operators of nursing homes. After the sudden death of her husband in 1998, Norma coped with her grief by writing a compelling story of her journey towards healing. Her book, Without Warning, Successfully Coping with Sudden Loss, is about triumph in the face of tragedy. 
If you do not have a copy of her book, you should go ahead and get it now. Norma conducted seminars and workshops on coping with and overcoming loss for a few years while continuing to work in the healthcare field. She retired in 2020. She is the proud mother of Christopher, a sports doctor in Birmingham, Alabama, and Nicole, a technical product owner at Neiman Marcus. Norma enjoys reading, walking, dancing, decorating, and spending time with her beautiful granddaughters, Tyson, Taylor, and Torin. She is a member of the City Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Dallas. On a personal note, I have known Norma for over 35 years. She is kind, she's loving, and she's a caring person, and she holds all my secrets. <laughs> There's never, never been a been time that I have not been able, able to call her, her to share my burdens. I have cried countless times while speaking to her, and she has reminded me that God's got this in so many words. She loves spending time with her grandbabies, and often we talk about how it's hard at our age running behind the little ones. She is the type of friend who tells you when you're wrong and will tell you when in, a, in many instances, when I need to take the high road, which most often I respond by saying, Norma, I'm going low. I am honored to introduce my friend, my sister, Norma Carter. Good afternoon, ladies, or good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes okay. we can. Okay. It's a privilege to be on. Thank you, Anisia, for the invitation to participate in this seminar or this workshop. And Pat, what a surprise. You didn't let on that you were introducing me. <laughs> but thank you. That was really nice. Ladies, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking on a subject that most people find uncomfortable especially if it's something that they haven't experienced. It's grief. Who likes to talk about grief? They say it's morbid, it's lurid, and it's something that they'd rather not deal with. When I was the director of grief ministries at my church, I remember asking the pastor if we could change the name to compassionate care because no one wanted to participate with anything to do with grief. We would have um, different special emphasis days at our church, which I'm sure many of you do, you know, health ministries day, women's ministry day, men's ministry, children's ministry, and grief ministry. And for some reason on those days, we just couldn't get people to participate, no matter how interesting you make it. I remember having a friend visit church once and they were leaving after church. And I said, you should stay. We have a great lunch. We have a lineup of speakers in the afternoon for a workshop. And then we have a uh, a concert saxophonist is going to play in the evening and and he was like uh, I don't think grief ministry nah I don't think I want to stick around for that but anyway even though grief is tough sometimes we try to soften it by referring to it as um, instead of talking about grief we say coping with loss or journey towards healing or beyond the tears etc cetera, etc cetera, something like that but it all comes down to grief and it's not just grief because of a death, but it could be grief because of a divorce or the loss of material possessions or probably a physical issue that you're having. It is grief. And we all go through that painstaking process of trying to recover. I know what it's like to grieve, having lost a spouse. My grief was long, hard, and sporadic. But thank God, with lots of hard work, prayer and support from lots of family and friends, I was able to survive, to cope, and to get on with life. Now, with this being an event for seniors, um, or as my son would refer to it, not so young, when I'd tell him that I'm a senior citizen, he'd say, mom, you're not so young. But it's the same thing. We're all seniors. We wonder, um, are the effects of grief the same as it is with younger people? 
grief is different for everyone. But there's some situations that we all experience like heartbreak, shock, bouts of crying, bewilderment. Those are pretty much standard across the board. But we all grieve differently. Now, as we get older and we handle, we see our loved ones passing, it causes us to reflect on our own mortality. And sometimes that just really awakens us to, you know, we're getting older. That's almost like the next stop. I remember seeing my dad cry, um, just really breaking down and crying when he found out that one of his friends died, someone that, his, that was his own age. And he just really lost. I don't remember ever seeing him cry like that before or after. Grief is one of life's harshest blows and it's one that's difficult to recover from. However, knowing that we can survive is motivation enough to keep us on the path to succeeding or to motivate us on the path to succeeding. Today, we're gonna to talk about grief, but we're gonna talk about it in the four, navigating the four seasons of mourning. So, the, as you know, the four seasons are winter, spring, summer, and fall. Well, or winter is gonna be the actual grieving process. When we're gonna go through our winter, that's gonna be the bleak process of grieving. Spring will be the process of growth where we'll be healing and growing. Summer, the season of gratitude. And fall, the season of giving back, helping others once we've learned to cope. And so we're gonna start off with the first season, which is the season of winter. Winter is the season that's most unpopular with most of us because it's cold and it's freezing, icy with blizzard conditions, heavy snow and freezing rain. A lot of these conditions can be life-threatening if we're not prepared or if we're exposed. The months can seem long, depressing and unending as if we may not able and we may not be able to go outdoors or just unless we're really covered up and bundled up. And so we stay in and so we're depressed. I know the winters in Texas aren't as bad as those up north, where the temp but the temperatures are pretty high sometimes and there's a bone chilling temperature that is enough to just keep you bundled up inside. I know that uh, I've experienced really um, severe winters when I lived in Canada. And I'm telling you, sometimes I remember being on the, waiting for a bus to go to work and the tears in my eyes would be frozen and I would just feel as if I couldn't move because everything was just frozen in place. Well, sometimes grief is like winter. After losing a, lost one, a loved one, it's emotional tundra that leaves us feeling heartbroken, devastated, as if you're on ice, free falling without anything to grab onto. It's pain, it's anger, just a plethora of emotions. I believe the loss of a loved one who has given our lives meaning and value can truly rock our world and devastate us. The conditions during our grief of winter or winter of grief is compounded, especially during the holidays. We have Christmas, we have Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, Valentine's. How do you celebrate when your heart is broken, when your heart is heavy? There's a, a, um, a winter onset seasonal active, affective disorder, otherwise known as SAD, that is a major subtype of depression that we can suffer through in the winter. We go from, it starts out mild and it becomes more severe and it includes things like irritability, tiredness, low energy, oversleeping, and other feelings that can complicate or ability to cope with the grief. These are normal stages. And I just don't want anyone to think that you're losing it because they're normal stages that most people have to go through. The first stage is shock. It's an emotional reaction, but it can also be physical. It insulates us and gradually dissolves as we're more able to handle our loss. We may feel as if we're just going through the motion, robot-like, to accomplish tasks. 
this is just the beginning. And then next we experience disorganization. This is when the real work of mourning begins. We begin working towards accepting the loss, the reality, and we feel the need to talk about our loved one over and over again as we go through our emotions. We have physical and emotional fatigue, and it's a time when we feel deep despair, when we rely on others to comfort us and provide a shoulder to cry on and a helping hand to help us to function. But you know what? There's hope because there's another season that's coming up, the season of spring, the season of growth. As spring is a period of renewal, so is this task. Spring is one of my favorite seasons because everything is fresh, budding, and new. It's a time of rebirth and awakening. This season creates happiness, motivation, and positivity as it pairs the way for new beginning. I can see the wheels turning in your head, wondering how do I get from a dark place of hopelessness, sorrow, and gloom to happiness and renewal? Growth, that's how. With God's grace, self-determination, along with love and support of others, we grow. One of the most important components in this growth is God's grace. It's a spontaneous gift from God. It's generous, free, and totally unexpected and undeserved. It takes the form of divine favor and love. Ladies, it's free. It's free. It's like spring showers on a thirsty soil producing green, lush foliage and beautiful flowers. It's you peeking out from under the covers of despair, determined to get up and start your day, putting one foot in front of the other. It's utilizing all of the support you received from loved ones as you utilize your inner strength to begin that growth. How does tragedy completely devastate one person while making another strong? Why do some people successfully heal while others remain shattered and snap under pressure? I believe that circumstances are something that we have absolutely no control over. However, the one thing that we can control is our attitudes and attitudes are a result of the choices that we make. We can either choose to remain shattered or we can confront the lessons of grief, painful though they may be and treat them as opportunities for growth. When we have the courage to do the latter, we have opted for a triumphant survival. Abram Lincoln said, always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any one thing. There's no question that life will deal you a lousy hand. It will. The only question is how will you respond when it happens? How will you respond? That's your choice. During your period of growth, some days you may feel strong and courageous, other days down in the dumps. But thank God for his promises outlined in scripture for us. He says in Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned and the flame will not consume you. Grief can be character building, morbid, as morbid as that sounds. Sometimes it resurrects a sleeping energy or a strength is aroused when unknown talents are recognized and when a clarity about life's purpose and direction becomes keener. Also, a strong sense of compassion is developed. God sometimes allows us to experience grief for growth, not to cripple and to restrict us. So how do you grow? How do you glorify God through this experience? Just as spring brings sunshine and rain, both elements are necessary to produce growth. And let me tell you, there's some stormy days here in Texas, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hail. We have them all here in the spring. And as with grief, we may get a weather alert. You know, we may get a, a text saying inclement weather forecasted. With grief, we may think that someone is on their um, deathbed and uh, you know, we'll lose them any moment. 
But when it happens, we're never prepared, no matter how many times you think death will bring relief from suffering. When it happens, we just are never prepared. And when we go through it, we think it'll never end. It's just unnerving and scary. One thing is certain though, and that is the storm will end. It won't last forever. And there's usually an unexplainable calm following a storm. Out of the darkest black clouds, God can cause crystal raindrops to fall. And the most beautiful sunsets come at the end of a cloudy day. Do you ever, have you ever been in a storm where you notice that it's just been torrential rain or even a tornado? And then there's this eerie silence at the end. There's just unbelievable calm that happens. The story is told of the great violinist, Ishak Perlman, who was performing one night at the Lincoln Center when one of the strings of his violin broke in the middle of his performance. Everyone thought he would get it fixed or find another violin to complete his piece. Well, he didn't neither. To everyone's amazement, he kept playing with such passion and resonance. The audience was stunned and there was an utter look of absolute amazement on their faces. They all knew it was impossible to play a symphonic work with only three strings. So how did he do it? Perlman had changed and recomposed the piece in his head. When the applause subsided, he smiled, wiped his brow, and said to the audience in pensive tones, sometimes it's the artist's task to find out how much music you can make with what you have left. His entire life was, play, was spent making music with four, string, four strings, I'm sorry, and then suddenly he found himself with three. And so he made music with only three. So it should be with us in a life riddled with sudden changes. We must make music with what we have left. After losing my husband, my kids wrote me letters one day uh, when I was really despondent to encourage me and cheer me up. And I remember the letter from my then 17 year old son, Chris, that he said, what once was a square must now develop into a triangle. Instead of four parts, we now have three. Dad will always be in our memories, but now more than ever, we must come to bed together and be a three-figured unit with a strong base, common points, and straight level lines. He said, you, mom, are that strong base. Throughout this ordeal, you've been there for Nikki and me. We must have common points and be on the same wavelength. It's essential that we stay level-minded and at times it's hard to concentrate, but we must continue on and be successful. Dad would want it that way. We had to take what life dealt us and use it as an opportunity for growth. So can you. Grief is like a heavy backpack. It doesn't get any lighter. You just get better at carrying it. The next season is summer. Summer is all about celebrating. The weather is warm and inviting and you can get out and enjoy the sunshine, the beach and the long days. You've done the hard work of trying to play the hand that you were dealt. And even though you may have had good days, it just takes something to just trigger a bad day and the waterworks just start to flow. Still, you concentrate on progress with God's grace, God's grace as well as support and encouragement from friends and family. And for that, we should be grateful. Now, let me say here that for the most part, people do care about what you're going through. And usually they search for expressions and platitudes to comfort you so that you can feel better. They are trying to be supportive and encouraging. Shakespeare says, everyone knows how to master grief, but he who has it. Everyone wants to tell you how to feel better, not having a clue how you really do feel. And they'll say all sorts of things, some of them a little bit inappropriate at the time. It may be true, but at the time, it's not something you want to hear. Things like, you'll be fine. You're strong. 
you'll get over it. You can marry again if you've lost a spouse or you can have another child. They're attempting to comfort you, but alas, it's just not making you feel any better. And then there are those who just won't say anything. They'll just look at you and be silent. I remember a friend telling me that after my husband died and she would be with me, she felt a little bit invisible because people would either walk up to me, walk up to us and go directly to me and probably offer a few words of sympathy, or they will just uh, give me a hug and she'd just stand there. But she said what was tickling to her was the people that would pass by and just give me the puppy dog look. And she would actually show me how they would just give you a sad look. But you know, it's true, things like that does communicate to you how people feel. Without having to say a word, you can give a touch, a hug, or a sympathetic look that communicates, I care, I'm sorry, I'm here for you. Here's some strength of mind to go on and some love to energize you. Jesus could have healed so many just by speaking it into existence, but so often, he stretched out his hand and his touch had power enough to heal those who needed healing. So give yourself permission to accept condolences as it is given and respond with gratitude. You may not feel like smiling or being warm and fuzzy, but you can say thank you and probably send a note or a card when you're feeling better. Remember, it's a new experience for both of you and there's no book that you or textbook that you study prior to the loss that gears you up for how you should respond to someone. People just react and they really mean well and just know that it's coming from a good place. So don't waste your time being emotional and getting upset. Just respond with gratitude. Remember, you have a lot on your plate as well. People may show up to bring a meal or to help you with the kids. The fact that they show up just says a million words. When you show gratitude, you express your thanks and you shift your focus from your head, which triggers grief and anxiety, to your heart. Feeling the optimism associated with gratitude may also give you the ability to manage your stress while coping is a lot easier. When you show gratitude, you express your thanks and shift your focus from your head to your heart. You can also keep a gratitude journal by giving thanks every day for what you've got, not for what you lost. Writing down the things that you've been thankful for helps you to develop a daily practice that keeps you accountable. I know I kept a journal. Um, it wasn't just a gratitude journal. It was a, a journal that about my entire experience the days that I felt great, the days that I got up and went to work and felt like I could accomplish anything, but there were days that I just couldn't even move. But when you look back and see from whence you came to where you are, you can only be grateful that God helped you take one step each day and for the support and the love that you had from others. Writing down things that you're grateful for helps you to keep a daily practice it also gives you the opportunity to be grateful for the time you had your loved one as a part of your life and be grateful for the wonderful memories that you created or enjoyed together. Gratitude helps us to embrace our grief to use as fuel to propel us forward in our healing. Practicing gratitude is also an effective tool that brings joy back into our life. In time, your grief will subside and you may feel ready to start looking for new ways to bring joy back into your life. Finding a new sense of purpose after a significant loss may help you heal from your pain. The season of summer is about nurturing and being grateful for the growth that you experienced during your spring due to the bleak grief of winter. Once you've navigated those seasons, the next is the season of fall. Fall is a season of spectacular colors on the trees. 
hues of gold, orange, brown, yellow, caramel, and other, other beautiful earth tones. We probably don't see much of that here in the South, but in the Northern states, the colors are breathtaking. I used to remember enjoy driving down the Don Valley Parkway in Toronto when I lived there. And I just did it, took that route so many times so that I could admire the fall foliage that lined the parkway. Sometimes I get so lost in looking at the spectacular beauty that I've completely missed my exit. The fall air is crisp. You feel alive and energized and you've arrived at your season of giving. Think of how far you've come as you've navigated the morning. You've grieved, you've grown, you've shown gratitude. And now, because you've survived and thrived, your beautiful colors are showing. You've become a much more compassionate person, understanding. Remember, tragedy creates character traits that allows us to be more relatable and caring and ready to give back. As beautiful as the trees are in fall, eventually they shed their leaves, which fall to the ground. And I know that once they hit the ground and the leaves are scattered everywhere and it tends to look a little bit messy. And so everyone gets busy raking them and bagging them to toss. But there's also benefit to the leaves remaining on the ground. They suppress weeds at the same time, fertilizing the soil, improving its structure. They also insulate plants from the cold weather and provide protection. You are now an overcomer. And so the leaves of fall fertilize the soil. So now you can pour into others the kindness you benefited from during your experience and help them heal as they navigate their period of mourning. When someone says to me, you are the only person who understands what I'm going through, what they're saying is, you've been where I've been. You understand the heartache, the pain. You've lost the spouse. You understand the bitterness and the frustration, but somehow you've managed to get through it. And the unstated plea is help me. Help me get through a life that seems totally meaningless. Help me heal. Of course, when someone's life is lying shattered, the only person that can really heal themselves is that person themselves, other than God. You can't do it for them. They will have to pick up the pieces and do it themselves. Nonetheless, the journey is made a lot easier when someone who has taken that journey before is right there with them navigating, or maybe you've been a, a little, a few feet or a few miles ahead of them. You've, it's happened to you just recently but you've been there and so you can help them go through their uh, period of rebounding. Uh, Aldous Huxley said, experience is not what has happened to you, it's what you do with what has happened to you. Usually after enduring a lot of pain and hardship and loss, an inner strength is developed within us. God never wastes a hurt. I know that's hard to understand, but the greatest service to others will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. Mull over that for a while. So what will you do with the grief that you've been through? Make your life significant. The best medicine after healing from hurt and pain is to show compassion and love for others who need prayer, guidance, comfort, a steady arm and a listening ear. There's nothing nobler than to extend help to another human being. And it's especially beneficial when the person in need senses that the helper can identify with and understand their situation. Because of the love and the help that we've received from our Lord and Savior, we are compelled and constrained to be our sister's keeper. If we're to follow scripture, then our spirit of compassion and giving should show that we're motivated and moved to help those confronted with grief and pain following a difficult loss. In 2 Corinthians 1, 4, we are encouraged to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves 
are comforted of God. So reinforce your faith, ladies, by giving comfort to others who are in need of help. By opening our hearts and our helping hands to others, we become better, more whole human beings. Having gone through my season of grief, which I believe was longer and harsher than normal, I felt propelled to share my pain, my peace, and my eventual recovery. I wanted others to know that they too can overcome a tragedy, a tragic loss, and live meaningful lives again. And that's why I wrote the book Without Warning, Successfully Coping with Sudden Loss. This was during my period of fall, the period when I had gone through the extreme grief, when I was grateful and I began to grow and I was grateful and I felt that I was in a position to help and give back to others. In closing, I hope what each of us takes from this is that as we navigate our seasons of mourning, it's that we allow ourselves a time of winter to experience the grief in hope that spring, the growth period will follow and that our summer will be filled with moments of gratitude <clears throat> as we prepare for fall, when we'll give back to others needing our help. <laughs> and as seniors aging gracefully and finishing well, I hope and pray that each of us will make each moment of our lives count as we take time to smell the flowers, enjoy outdoor walks, socialize with and appreciate our family and friends and live life to the fullest. <clears throat> yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Does Jesus care when my heart is sad to deeply for a song as the burdens press and the care
beautiful, just beautiful. What was her name? Teresa Morton. Teresa Morton. Thank you. Hey. All right, Sister Gwen Brown. You're Hello. up. <clears throat> Hello, my name is uh, Gwen Brown and I'm from Shiloh here in Little Rock. And I'm introducing our next speaker, which is um, Elder Doris Gwen Hunter. Elder Hunter is a native of Trinidad and Tobago. She received her nursing education in the United Kingdom. After graduating from nursing and midwifery schools, she completed her training in neonatology and obtained a certification in, in that specialty. After which she immigrated to the USA upon, recruit, upon recruitment by Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas to join their neonatal program. Her nursing career spanned 41 years in which she acquired a vast amount of critical care management experience. The last 14 years of her career was spent in clinical trial research. She worked as a research nurse at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston, Texas in, stroke, in the stroke program and MD Anderson Cancer Center there in Houston as well, where she managed uh, phase one and phase two clinical trials in the area of liquid tumors such as leukemia and lymphoma. She returned to Arkansas in 2013 and continued clinical trial researches in the um, Myeloma Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. She managed multiple trials in the myeloma supportive care, and she is a contributing author in a major article entitled Influenza, an Outbreak in an Ambulatory Stem Cell Transport Center. Transplant Center, I'm sorry. She remains, uh, she retired in December of 2017, and uh, she remains very active in her retirement. She is now a certified health coach with a specialty in adults and seniors. She is currently in advanced training for certification as a master health coach and her graduation date is projected for May 22nd of this year. She also has a certificate in health evangelism. She is an ordained elder since 2002, and she is a member of the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Little Rock. She remains active in her local church in the areas of health and women's ministries. She is the Women's Ministries District Leader for the state of Arkansas, and she also represents Arkansas on the Constitution and Bylaws Committee of the Southwest Region Conference. When she is not spending time with her family and friends, she enjoys speaking engagements, reading, writing, decorating, and traveling. She is blessed with one son, five grandchildren, and one great-granddaughter. She, she is grateful to God for the blessings of a rewarding career, a great circle of family and friends, and she has had a life well lived. For me, she has been the epitome of what friendship and sisterhood means. She is a natural comic, she is fiercely loyal and trustworthy. And I have found her to be honest, almost brutally honest in most cases. Her love for Christ is unwavering and she has a very deep desire for his people to grow spiritually, emotionally, as we all await his soon coming. I love Gwen with my whole heart because I have found her to be a true friend. Our next speaker will be that of Elder Gwen Hunter. Thank you. 
Hello. My topic is finding purpose in seasons of change. It is an honor to share the spotlight on grandmothers today. I want to address the importance of their changing roles and the contributions that they make to our society. We must change our mental model of fixed determinants such as old, sick, confined, and ultimately waiting for God. Instead, we must visualize women who are dynamic, interconnected, full of living qualities, and intentionally living purposeful lives. I am a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and I approve this message. In nature, the seasons change naturally from one to the other. Spring is pregnant with dreams and possibilities. Summer encapsulates activities of learning and growing in order to accomplish set goals. Autumn or fall is a mixture symbolic of plenty, harvest, abundance, and at the same time, decline, decay, and even death. Winter brings self-reflection and some of life's painful experiences, such as solitude, grief, depression, and, and the end of the year. So what does the Bible have to say about seasons? Well, Ecclesiastes admonishes that there is a season for everything. In Genesis, it states, in 8.22 states, while earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter shall not cease. Having this knowledge, how does this inform our purpose for the seasons of our lives? Well, let us unpack the case study of a biblical grandmother. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 to 6 says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned, or in other words, the sincere faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of hands. Lois is the perfect example of a godly grandmother. Lois had a generational mindset. She cultivated faith in her daughter, but did not stop there. She continued working and investing in the next generation. She discipled her grandson, Timothy. We are mandated by God to teach our offsprings. Deuteronomy 4.9 says, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and their children after them. And in Psalms 78, 4, it says, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Outside of parents, grandparents have the most influence on grandchildren. Therefore, we cannot declare that our work is finished and leave the discipline of our grandchildren to others. Grandmothers, would you say that they're unsung heroes? Well, let's check. Let's look at some of the responsibilities that grandmothers are tasked with. Child care providers for their working children so that they, the children, could advance their careers and have balanced work-life experience. First-line caregivers to their orphaned or abandoned grandchildren. They also advise young women on health care issues. Grandmothers are the largest source of ch child care for working women. In Italy and Greece, that number is about 50%. Grandmothers are having to rearrange their working schedules to care for their grandchildren, which in fact results in additional loss of income and reduced pension. What are the roles of grandmothers then? In both developed and developing countries, they may differ, but they're crucial to their families nonetheless. 
what are the values of grandmothers as it relates to in-kind agreement? Grandmothers are called upon to make many sacrifices. Therefore, are they truly empowered if they must sacrifice their freedoms without some type of in-kind agreement with their children based on the expanded roles that they are performing? They are caregivers, teachers, mentors, historians, spiritual leaders, and not to mention the wealth of social and life skills that they bring to the table. So some of the ways in which an in-kind exchange can be agreed upon are maybe paid vacation, contribute financially to their pension fund, pay insurance deductibles and out-of-pocket expenses. And also, don't forget estate planning. So estate planning simply means the process of, of anticipating and arranging during your life for the management and the disposal of your estate. In the event that you become incapacitated or at your death, this includes things like power of attorney, advanced healthcare directives, a will or living trust, charity, charitable donations. Be reminded that you will not die one minute earlier if you make a will than if you did not. We need to get rid of that. If you have $1 and one relative or $1 and no relatives, you need to have a written will in place because that $1 will be tied up in probate court. And of course, the state will acquire it eventually. Some of the gut-wrenching wailing that you hear at funerals has more to do with the question, who's going to pay for this funeral? Simply because preparations were not put in place. As much as is possible, we must avoid burdening our children financially as it relates to our demise. There should be serious decisions with documentations done beforehand. Yes, I realize that these conversations are uncomfortable, but not nearly as uncomfortable when you compare it to your children and grandchildren fighting over that $1. Other important conversations are things such as, where will grandmother spend her final days? Should she be cared for in her own home or should she be cared for in a, in a room in the home of one of her children? Or should they consider assisted living or a nursing home? These are time sensitive conversations that are of high priority. As grandmothers, we can have collaborative relationships with our grandchildren. We live in an ever-changing world where we have to keep up with technology. It becomes necessary to depend on children and grandchildren to educate us, I mean the grandmothers, so that we can stay abreast with the very basics. There are different video platforms that can be utilized, such as FaceTime, WhatsApp, Zoom, to name a few. If the pandemic taught us nothing else, we have learned that social isolation is no fun. As we safe distance, it is direct and, and it directly impacts our mental health. Being able to see and verbally interact with our grandchildren is a great source of comfort. Some of us have knowledge gaps in the area of technology that our grandchildren can help us with. We can share our knowledge with them and our skills and strengths that we possess, we can exchange that for their tech savvy, I mean their tech savvy and other interactive games that they can help us to sharpen our minds with. I want to talk a little bit about blue zones. Blue zones are areas of the world where centenarians, people who are one year, 100 years and over, live and thrive. It is important to know that they thrive, they don't just live. Some of us think that as we get older, we should just barely get by. I don't believe that is what God wants for us. 
We should not just exist, but we should thrive in our existence. There are five areas in the world that have this des designation, it's blue zones. Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikea, Greece, and Loma Linda, California. There are commonalities among centenarians. They push themselves into activity. They garden, they walk, they run, all of these things. They eat a plant-based diet. They have a sense of purpose, and we need to have that. They are faith-based communities. There's high level of connectivity, and they belong to a tribe. We are hardwired to crave social interactions. And when we live in isolation, there is a level of subconscious stress that grates at us. Spending time with our grandchildren is valuable and is a powerful motivator that drives us to desire to remain active and well. We must reframe negative statements such as, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Reframe them to be more positive and affirming, such as, I am strong, I'm healthy, and I'm energized. We must decrease the voice of doubt and increase the voice of destiny. Having that knowledge of our God-given purpose to be motivated and curious. Sometimes our plans miscarry because they have no aim. Staying positive is very important. We must extend grace to ourselves for the things that we did not get right. We must also recognize that at times our grandchildren do not know what harbor they are heading for. Therefore, no wind is the right wind. But with permission, we must gently help them to navigate their way and do it with empathy. Hold judgment and extend grace. Sometimes people don't really want advice. They just want you to be there while they talk to themselves. Holding space. I'd like to talk a little bit about holding space. Holding space means that we are willing to walk alongside another person in whatever journey that person is on without judging or making that person feel inadequate or try to fix them. When we hold space for others, we open our hearts. We offer unconditional support and we let go of control. We must, only hold, we must not only hold space for our grandchildren, but for all children who are in the sphere of our influence. There are so many people in the world today who are calling themselves influencers. May I ask, what type of influence? As godly grandmothers, we must strive to be the biblical grandmother that Lois was, Timothy's grandmother. We must have that generational mindset that Lois had and teach our children and their children. We must live a purposeful driven life, regardless of the season we're in. People should see us as space holders with whom they can be vulnerable without fear of being judged. May we continue to age gracefully and finish well. Thank you. Amen, amen. Well, we have had a lot of wonderful information given to us tonight. And I'd like to try to unpack a bit of it with your questions. What questions? Let's go back to our first presenter, uh, Sister Carter. What questions do you have on the information that she shared with us about the seasons, the seasons of grief? Any questions? I wanted to um, say um, with the, the grandparents, um, 
of the grandmother is grandparents as well. Uh, my husband was listening to, uh, he's, he, he's not, uh, he was just wondering why they didn't say anything about the grandfathers too. But yeah, we were both listening to that and that was very informational about the wheels and things like that. So um, uh, power of attorneys and, and all of that information is, is good to know. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Okay. And it is uh, regarding the grief. Okay. Uh, okay. Sister, Sister Norma, in the season of grief, how do you tell um, your friends and loved ones that you have not gotten over that grief and stop expecting you to get over it yesterday? That's a good question. Now you can be tactful or you can just um, tell them how you feel as you feel it, as you're feeling it. Because the average American expects you to be through with grief in three months. And for most people, especially after a sudden death, it takes up to seven years sometimes. I remember uh, shortly after my husband died and we had a business to run. So when he died, everything just fell on me and nothing stopped the day he died, nothing but his heart. And so life went on. So I had to keep working. And I remember coming out of a bank one day <clears throat> after doing some business and I met one of my employees and she looked at me and she said, you know, it's time you start smiling again. You need to just, you know, not look so solemn all the time. You need to get over it. And I just shook my head and I said, you're a better person than me. Because, you know, I wanted to say more, <laughs> but I just, you just have to follow your heart. But I think that people just don't know what to say and lashing back doesn't help anyone. So I would just say, pray for me or maybe um, soon, hopefully. It's how I feel right now. I'm working on it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. If, if did, did someone else have one? Yes, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, how do you know when you have healed from grief? I believe you said that your grief was a long period. And um, how do you know when you're at the end of grief or when you've healed or when you've completely grieved over something? I, I'm not sure I can answer that. I can only speak to myself. I know everybody heals at their own pace. And sometimes they say, if you've anticipated a death, um, the healing is a lot quicker as opposed to a sudden death. However, I think you may feel as if you're healed, as if you're coping and you're doing well. And sometimes there's just a trigger that just brings it all back and you take two steps back. That's why they say grief is like, an ocean with waves, you know, it's up and down. And so I'm not sure how you completely, or some people may not completely heal. They learn how to cope with it. Um, another story recently, just recently, and it's been 20 years for me. I was cleaning out my garage with my daughter and we came across this box with cards and letters that people sent me shortly after my husband died. And it was in my garage and I moved into this other house. It's been, I guess, since 2005. And so they've just been there. And she said, oh, we can't throw these out. We have to keep these. And I was like, why? But these are what people wrote to you during when dad died. And I said, but I have it in my heart. Well, she said, okay, I'll keep them. And so she didn't take them to her place. She put them in another room in the house. <laughs> and so when I was um, looking for something the other day here, I see this box with all these cards and letters. And so what do I do? I sit there and start going through them. And you would think that it was back in 2019, well, 1998, because I just cried. It just broke my heart hearing the sentiments that people um, sent me. And it just brought everything back to the surface. So saying that, I'm, I'm sure I'm healed or I am healing, but it just takes something to trigger that pain or that memory. And, um, you know, you wonder, am I really over it? I don't know if there's 
depending on the loss, the significance of the loss. I'm not sure if there's anyone that can say, I am completely healed over that or I'm over it. I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Uh, may I? I had my Ms. hand uh, raised. Uh, my I'm hand sorry. Hand. I'm so sorry. Ms. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I wanted to respond to the person who asked um, about the inclusion of, of um, grandfathers. And I'd like to say that I was um, addressing grandmothers. However, I am aware that grandfathers play uh, a role in, um, in, in the upbringing of grandchildren and yes, they're vital. But we must understand that typically um, grandmothers um, tend to be the ones who are tasked with raising children, whether the children are being abandoned by their mothers or, or, or because of the debt. For example, in Africa, where you have um, the, so many people, young mothers and fathers died of, of HIV AIDS. And for some reason, it behold that the, it was the, the grandmothers who end up raising those children because some of those grandfathers also died too. And some of them, their, their, their lifestyle contributed to that. But generally, um, grandmothers are the ones that are tasked with taking care of the children while their, um, they, their <laughs> children work, because maybe granddad is also still working. And um, to the question that was asked to, um, to Norma about grief, I think that for some reason, we don't quite know how, as you mentioned before, we don't quite know how to respond to grief. And so we feel we must say something. And sometimes we do not need to say anything. We just need to be there, being with, being with that person, just being there. And the thing about it, Norma, you will know that the, the process of grief is not linear. It is not a straight line. There's lots of ups and downs and you go to the stages and you think you're done with that and then you go back to it again. Um, one of the most prolific writers about grief is Dr. Kubler-Ross. And even though it was designed for children who died and their parents were having divorce and all kinds of things because of the death of a child. And so I think that um, we need to extend grace to people who are grieving and you don't always have to say anything. Just be there. I think it's worse when you don't acknowledge the person. You act like the person is not there at all. But to say to you that your face is sour, that is crazy. And it just goes to show how much we do not know about that topic. And also, most of the times what we are looking at when we think people have recovered, we're looking at resilience. There's a difference between resilience and the fact that you are still traumatized. So you may have bounced back because like you said, your husband died and the work did not stop. You had to do it. So you had to do what you had to do. But it does not mean that you were not traumatized. And every time someone else says something, you are re-traumatized all over again. We really need to understand that if we don't know what to say, it's best not to say anything. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Moore. Sister Linda Moore, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I did. I had wanted to uh, make a comment on the uh, knowing when grief is over or what uh, the young lady has said. Uh, my husband passed in 2020. And I think the, to educate yourself on the trigger, like uh, the speaker has said that even if it's 20 years, she, she started reading the cards and it just brought back memory. And like you said, I don't think you get over it, but you learn how to live with it. But knowing your truth helps where you can maintain the grief of being heartbroken, or fearful, or, or things of that nature. And uh, just educating yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I had a Thank question. You. Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted, did she get rid of the box? Asked her, did she get rid of the box with all the all the carts and things? Did you move it? I did just this week. 
just this week because there was a, a shredding place and I was taking some old papers I did, yes. Yes, good, good. Amen. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I have a question for, for, for both. Did someone start to speak? Uh, yes, Sister Shepherd. I have a question to Sister Gwen Hunter. Okay. Why is it that grandparents always seem to feel so guilty uh, when it comes to babysitting their grandchildren? Why is it that they have a difficult time saying, I've done it, it's your turn. Uh, I will help you when I feel like it. Okay. Well, now you may not necessarily agree with my answer. This is <laughs> one grandmother who is not taking that on, if I can help it. And it's being made clear up front. <laughs> so um, I don't think that there should be any guilt associated with it. Um, I think that you should just state your case. Um, you are, you, sometimes you may be able to do it and sometimes you're not able to do it. And I don't think that there should be any guilt associated with it. Um, you know, here is the thing. Once we decide to have children, planned or unplanned, whatever happens, that is our responsibility. And yes, I, I am thankful and grateful that I had a mother who was able to take care of my child so that I can go off um, to, to, to planned um, education courses in, in England. And, and so my pregnancy was unplanned and, and that was a setback for me. Occasionally I refer to it as an oops, but um, <laughs> a big uh, oops. A big <laughs> You're not the only one, Sister Hunter. Well, I mean, I mean, well, there was a little oops that happens. But no, we have to, we have to shoulder our responsibility. And don't get me wrong. I think that we should help our grandchildren as much as we can. But at the same time, I don't think that we should allow them to manipulate and take over our lives. And, and, and they're so entitled, this, this Amen. generation, all, all that entitlement. And I am not for that. And I let them know right away, I'm not for that because I worked hard. I was thankful to my parents and I worked hard and I was never sassing anybody and acting. They Amen. want to sass you. They want to sass you. And then they want to bring your child, pull up at your door and ring the door behind right. their child. That's wrong. Amen. That's right. You say it as if I'm 72 years young and I got a lot to do. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Sister Hunter. Now this 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 may be controversial or whatever, but you know, I'm looking at there's a difference in helping out with the grandchildren versus raising the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of grandparents today who have full responsibility yes. for raising grandchildren. What are your thoughts about that? Do you think there are too many grandparents raising their grandchildren? And if so, why? I, I, I have to agree with you. I think the statistics land on too many of them. And, and that's because a lot of the grandchildren that they're raising are of their grandchildren who are not of age to be having babies. So you have, you're raising a 15 year old that's in your house and the 15 year old's baby um, mm -hmm. all at the same time. And so what has happened is that our young ladies, and of course the men are not around, don't get me started on that, but that's a totally <laughs> different subject and we'd be here all evening. So now grandparents end up taking care of their grandchildren and great grandchildren. It is not fair. And I don't know what the answer is, except, you know, you do your best with your children and your grandchildren. You try to train them up in the way they ought to go. And yet, you know, things happen. And so, but what I have found is that somehow with this entitlement thing, they seem to think that you, the grandmother, should really help them. And, and they, they don't even have a nice way of asking. They think it's your responsibility. And somehow, somehow we have to point 
it back to them and say, no, that is your responsibility. I don't mind if you're gainfully employed and every now and again, I have to, you know, uh, take care of your child because you couldn't get the child to take care. I don't mind that. But when you think that you're entitled, that as a grandmother, I'm supposed to raise your child, I have issues with that. Yeah. I really yeah. Have Amen. That. Absolutely. Okay. I also have, unless someone else has a question, I'd like to ask Sister, Sister Norma a question. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, Sister Norma, I found your presentation so very interesting. I have not had the, the grief presented by seasons. I've never heard that presentation before. You know, I've heard the, uh, you know, the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. I've heard that. And, and that is usually, if I ha have attended some sort of seminar or whatever about grief, that's what they use. But I really like what you had to say here. My question for you is, which books do you recommend for those who are grieving? And, and does it depend on the loss? Because I'm talking all grief, whether it's a, through a death, a divorce, whatever, loss of a job. Is there something in particular or a basic book that would cover all of that? or do you recommend different different books? There are so many out there. I can't recommend a specific one other than mine without warning. Without <laughs> but, warning. Um, <laughs> I, I read so many. There were so many devotionals for um, widows. There were devotionals for grief in general. Um, I can't even think of a specific one. I remember one that really helped me and it was written by um, Joan Rivers. It was a secular book. I think it was called Rebounding. And that, it was just the way she wrote it because you know, she is a, she's not around anymore, but she's a comedian. Right. But um, other than that, there's so many inspirational books. Gosh, I can't even think of specific ones right now. Max Lucado um, mm -hmm. wrote, um, gosh, you think I had a list. You just kind of threw me there, but um, you just put in grief. I know at church, we have a handbook that we put in. A, um, it's called a, we call it our comfort kit. Whenever someone's lost, we give them a handbook and different um, reading material to do with this specific loss, if it's loss of a child or loss of a parent. Um, and so we get those and give them, and we also give them a journal. Okay. Is, you know, you can just find a loss for a parent or a spouse or, but I, I'm sorry, I can't think of a specific book that I would say I would recommend right now, but there are okay. tons of literature out there. Yes. Um, just put grief in. And I think that it also will depend on what it is you're grieving. Okay. Any it's other hard, comments um, or questions? Let me just say here though. Um, okay. Grief to do with divorce is really hard to, um, to help people with because you know they're so private. And even though the loss in divorce is sometimes harsher than loss of death, I've been told, because you, know, you have to see that person that made a choice to, to you know, separate themselves from you. And if you're not along in the same vein, that grief apparently is really very heavy. But it's hard to, I find even with our um, grief support, it's hard to, to talk to people about divorce because they're so private and nobody wants to open up um, about their situation unless they go to a personal uh, um, psychologist or someone, a therapist that's going to help them. But we've had support groups at our church that we've asked people to come who are divorced and very rarely do people show up. They don't like to share that in an open setting. Understand. May, I, may I add uh, something? I see a hand raised. Uh, Langini? Am I saying that correctly? Yes, close. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I'm in Georgia. Thank you for the young lady who invited me yesterday. I've been blessed. Thank you so much, ladies. I was wondering if there's any way how we can get all this information. Sister Archibald, can you address that? Is she still with us? Yes, just contact uh, the Southwest Region Conference Women's Ministries, and we will be happy to make those available to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sister Archibald. So well, I think we're, go ahead. I, I am, are you still talking to the other lady? So I just no, went, South Conference, what? Southwest South Region Conference. Region Conference. Women's Ministry Department. Okay, thank you so much. Very welcome. Good job. Uh, Sister Hunter, and then we will wrap up unless there's um, another question. I was going to um, just piggyback on what Norma was saying about the divorce um, situation. Um, before I was um, um, divorced and she was my, my friend Gwen who introduced me, she said to me at one point, she says, divorce is worse than the loss of a spouse. Um, she always said that the pain is so searing and the fact that you still have to deal with that person because they're not six feet under, you have to see them, you have children and you have to interact. And so it's so hard, but I think as it relates to the church, we have not found a way to address that. And that's something that concerns me that because we want to lump everything together as singles ministry. Well, there is, there is loss and there is loss. And if you've never been married, the, what you feel about being single is totally different from someone who was married and is now single or someone who That's had true. a spouse and the spouse died or whatever. So we need to look at the root cause of what the problems are. And I will say that divorced people have different problems um, than your average person who's just not married or whatever. And for some reason, it seems like when we look at the church and how we're set up, we seem to give the idea, even if we're not saying it verbally, that divorcees are kind of on the lowest ring of the toting pole. And I, I, so it's not surprising that people do not want to come and talk about their problems because they feel judged. You know, people want to know, well, why did you divorce? You know, and, and, and God, I, one lady, an elderly lady um, who claims she's going to heaven, but I'm not going because I'm divorced, not once, but twice. And so she said that, um, you know, she said, God hates divorce. And I said, well, you know what? I really think that there are other things that he hates. For example, the way you are treating me, like I'm, I've got leprosy and you're talking to me like I've got a tail and you don't want anything to do with me because I was so wrong in, in not staying in a situation that uh, even God would not allow me to stay in. So these are the kinds of things that you have to deal with. And no wonder people don't want to talk because everybody have this set mindset. Oh, God hates the boss. And I always want to turn around and say, oh, not as much as he hates you, but I know that's not right. <laughs> okay, so with Love that, you. I want us to again thank and applaud the ladies for their presentations tonight. They were so very, very helpful. At least they were to me. I've been blessed. And I thank you so much. I enjoyed the music. I enjoyed everything tonight, and I hope you did as well. So with that, Sister Faye, are you still with us? Sister Faye will be giving us our closing prayer. Let me make sure she's still here. If she isn't, I will do so. Just before we do the prayer, I would like to encourage everyone to tune in tomorrow. It is our final presentation. It is at 11 o'clock. Please invite your friends and please come prepared to move your body. Okay, we <laughs> hope to see you. We're going to have fun and it will be educational with everything that we do. So God bless you and please share it with your friends. Amen. Amen. I don't think Sister Faye is still with us. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for tonight, Lord. We thank you for these ladies, and we ask that you would bless them and keep them as they continue to minister to others. Father, let us all be ministers. You've told us that we're all disciples. So help us all to disciple in whatever way that you have given us to disciple. Father, we thank you. We ask for forgiveness of our many sins and where we have fallen short. 
Father, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your goodness. And so, Father, we ask for your protection over each household as we sleep and slumber on tonight, Father. And it is our prayer that you will touch us and wake us up in the morning and that we will rejoin tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. to close out this beautiful, these beautiful workshops that we've experienced this weekend. Thank you, Lord, for Sister Archibald and her leadership. And we thank you for all of the presenters. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.